we have an apology from uh, Councillor Tavish, not Danes. Uh, I'll move that that be received. Councillor Hawkins, Councillor Pete, those in favour, please say aye. Against aye, oh, that's agreed. Uh, and as I intimated earlier, um, um, I have a motion from. What's the matter? The bottle. You're talking? Is your mic on? Can you not hear me? One, two, three. Sorry, um, as I intimated earlier, I think it would be sensible. People seem to agree. Um, I'll move, second to Councillor Hawkins, that we uh, confirm the agenda with the movement of item six to proceed item three, so it becomes the first item, so that Dr Griffin doesn't have to cool his heels for too long while we discuss campers and dogs, and he can go off and do more fa fabulous things at the museum. So could we move, uh, could I put that? Those in favour, please say aye. 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 No, that's agreed. Dr Griffin, would you like to come up, please, and um, talk, make any comments you wish to about your report? And um, to remind councillors of item three, uh, a reminder to stand aside any matters um, where there's interest beyond that of the general public. Now, Dr Griffin, you would like to make some comments about the report? Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to make some brief comments um, the report's in front of you. Uh, I just want to summarise perhaps the most important thing that's happened at the museum in the last um, couple of months has been the announcement that we will be opening a new planetarium um, hopefully at the end of October and that's summarised briefly in this report. Um, there's a lot of activity going on. Obviously I refer to our submission um, as part of the annual plan in process. Um, and uh, we've had a number of successful exhibitions and uh, I've just come away from a very, very busy museum um, because it seems that people like to come to the museum on cold, snowy days. Um, so I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions? Anywhere? Any items from the report? Councillor Peck. Yeah, thank you. Again, um, you mentioned the, the planetarium which um, well, obviously excite quite a, um, uh, an interest in the need in the night sky and, and I know you've, you've presented to the Utaga Peninsula Community Board in terms of potential for, uh, for watching the stars and the aurora and so on. I'm just um, wondering, if, if, I mean, you've, you've also flagged the, the, uh, the issue of kind of how light can spill into the heavens and, and affect that and I'm just wondering if you have any comments on you know, what needs we, what we need to do as a council to, to support the, the development of night, night sky viewing and, and the possible big tourism that might eventuate from that. Um, well, as I say, speaking from the museum's perspective, we see the planetarium as um, not just um, a brilliant educational tool, we see it as potentially an anchor for um, a, a new strand of tourism in the, in the city, as you referred to, Neville. Um, I've just uh, two weeks ago I went to see the lunar eclipse up at um, Mount Cook and on that night the existing um, night sky tourism facility at Lake Tekapo at Mount John was completely full of people paying $250 a night. Um, to the Tekapo economy night sky tourism is worth between 15 and 20 million dollars a year that's an independent economic impact assessment um, and Tekapo is four hours from the nearest airport and the infrastructure in Tekapo can't really accommodate large numbers of people. Uh, so the museum is, we see night sky tourism as something that we can help develop in this area. Um, so we're building a planetarium and in our offering for later in the year we're actually offering um, um, uh, experimental uh, night sky tourism opportunities. So we are offering chances for people to come and see a planetarium show and then we will take them out to Hooper's Inlet or Papua Nui to view the night sky through a telescope. And for that to be successful, we've got to protect the night sky in that particular places because um, obviously if we have too much light over there, you don't get a good view of the, of, the, of the night sky. So one of the things I would encourage councillors to do, and I know the council is very interested in this, is when you are thinking about um, new lighting solutions for the city, ensuring that they're full cut-off solutions, ensuring that um, they don't potentially, while well, save money from a, a green perspective, don't pollute the night sky more than the existing solution that we have. And I know the council officers are working very hard on this, and I look forward to working with them to hopefully make sure that not only do we have a fantastic new set of street lights, but they're the, the best in the world and Dunedin has great night skies. And hopefully lots of people will then come and stay overnight and spend lots of money in the economy. 
It does uh, lead to one more question in terms of roading infrastructure and parking for, for um, you know, waves of people that might come out in the night. And I, I, I mean, that, this council would, would obviously have, a, have to have a, a role to play in that uh, in developing that. And uh, I guess you see, do you see, um, you know, um, the, the development of, of uh, viewing uh, uh, areas as, as, uh, as something for the future? Oh, absolutely, yes. I mean, um, the existing infrastructure can deal with relatively small numbers, but I wouldn't, I would hope certainly not to have thousands of people coming out every night, but um, certainly um, the Otago Peninsula is already well equipped for, for na nature tourism, um, and I think the, the night sky nicely complements that. Thank you, Councillor Vanderwas. Um, in the interests of not just the city street lighting, but the commercial lighting and residential lighting that uh, will inevitably uh, develop, especially with the change to LEDs. Uh, do we as a council in consents have the technical uh, limitations, if you like, to be able to specify that all future lighting is going to basically be essentially compliant with a night sky ideal. That is to say, I know that we're changing to LED lighting for street lighting and that whoever's doing that is definitely looking at the shuttering of, of those lights, but do we have a technical specification? Is that something that you're able to supply to our consents department? And do we as a council need to move in the direction of getting consent staff to include that as a requirement for any new building or commercial lighting? Um, well, I'm, I'm certainly not technically, um, I, I don't know the legal situation with regard to what the consents are, but, but certainly there are um, technical solutions that have been implemented in places like Lake Tekapo, um, where they do literally control the lighting that is allowed in town, and it works very effectively, and um, it's seen as a, an economic benefit for, for the town to do that. Um, and as a, a way of setting itself apart from any other city. And, and Dunedin could be the biggest city in the world to, to be a dark sky city. Um, and there are certainly um, solutions that can be shared with the, with the council. And I know, in fact, the officers are already looking into this because I think they, they've seen what can be done elsewhere. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that they will choose a good solution. So you know they're looking into it in terms of council-owned street lighting. Do you know if they're also uh, including it in consent requirements? Um, I'm not aware of the situation. I, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. I'll, I'll ask elsewhere. Thank you. Councillor Kelva. Do we or could we interact with the people up north who are now teaching navigation by the stars? Um, well, absolutely. When we um, one of the shows that we're opening the planetarium with is a, a show about um, it's called Manifest Two: The Power of the Stars, and it talks all about the uh, Maori knowledge. Um, John Broughton, who's a well-known playwright around here, has been commissioned to write that for the museum. So we will absolutely talk about not just you know the night sky as it is, but also the um, the, the cultural knowledge of the folks who sailed the Pacific Ocean um, a thousand years ago. And uh, that's a, a key part of what we want to do with the planetarium. Thank you. Um, the reports for noting. I'll move that. Oh, Councillor Pete. I'm not just going to move or second. I'll move that it be noted and seconded, Councillor Pete. Any further discussion? Those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, no. That's a good Thank you, Dr. Brown. That takes us to item four. Uh, Mr. Saunders, you're on your own. Uh, thank you, councillors. Um, Richard, is there anything you want to, um, any comment you want to make about the report before we go to questions? Uh, I, perhaps I should say first, um, I think we all appreciate the, um, the nature of the issue, many of the issues here, uh, and more importantly, appreciate the work that you have put in over a long period around some difficult issues to manage um, this, this problem uh, presents itself because of the way the law is and so on, uh, and also manage the concerns of local business and today. So uh, I think it's important that that's on the record. So um, having said that, any comment you want to make about what you've presented to us? Uh, no, happy to take questions. All right, first, Councillor Hawkins. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, firstly, uh, thank you, Richard and, and all staff, for this <coughs> new and improved reporting format. Um, it's been quite useful. But I have a question about the summary of considerations. And I don't know if this is a teething problem with the new setup or a Freudian slip or otherwise, but under the fit with strategic framework, only economic development is noted when surely this would impact on our environment or our parks and recreation strategies also and whatever, however developed they are at this point. Uh, it, it could, it could. Yeah, I guess we, we saw a specific fit with economic development at this stage. I'm sure it will have um, impacts on, on others to varying degrees. Um, I guess that was the one we we identified specifically at this time, but I take your point, it could impact on a number. Mm. They, they don't have to just, uh, it might be a question for Mr Pickford, they don't have to pick, authors don't have to pick one, do they? No. Um, through the chair, no. Um, but Rich is correct in that um, you could choose, um, that there's probably a, an impact across many different strategies, um, but the economic development one is a, it's a primary one, I would suggest. Thank you. And my second question is just about the existing bylaw itself on page 411, 23.4 interpretation, um, where it says camp means to stay overnight or more than one night at any local authority area in a car, camper van, caravan, etc. Um, is that that's defined by the legislation, that interpretation, or is that our interpretation? Uh, I understand that is our interpretation, but if you... Just having sat on that hearing, my understanding is that it may have been limited because it couldn't include a boat under the legislation. You couldn't yeah. use a boat. You could, you could, we couldn't restrict staying on a boat. Yeah, I think so, one yeah. of the issues that yeah. is going to flow from whatever council decides or committee decides today is that we are really going to have to work very thoroughly through a consultation process to nail down um, what we can do and what we can't do. So, so to answer your question, it's not set by the Freedom Campaign Act, so that is our, that is our definition. Right. But, but using this definition, were we to have gone down a prohibition route rather than the enabling route that we have, it would have been an offence for anybody uh, in those areas to be sleeping in their car overnight as per this. So for example, in any residential area, North Dunedin, South Dunedin, Macandra Bay, whatever, if you've had one too many beverages and decided to sleep it off rather than drive home. Yeah. If freedom camping were prohibited in those areas, that would be an offence. Technically it would be. Okay. If they were within a prohibited area. Um, I'm happy to move the recommendations. Thank you. Can I just, uh, just before you do, I want to ask a question, Richard, about the um, paragraph 4-5, uh, paragraph 35, where you talk about the Queenstown situation where essentially half of the but less than half of the fines that have been issued have, has been collected. Um, you will recall we discussed the possibility of uh, it might be an approach to government. Is there any capacity um, for collection at the border of unpaid fines of this kind as is being followed up with the, the border controls on other outstanding debt when people go um, to leave? To to the best of my knowledge, there's not. The the approach Queensland Lakes are taking uh, is to request changes to allow it to be collected directly off the rental car companies. Uh, that won't address people who come and purchase vehicles and camp and then sell them and leave. Oh, so there's currently no capacity no. for at all the collection. No. So that might be, as part of the process, we'd be able, should we choose to, uh, to ask, ask government for that change by way of minor regulation change to include this sort of infringement in that wider capture which would be helpful for everyone. Mm. All right. Um, now, Councillor Hawkins, you were moving, you were moving the recommendation on page four. Oh, sorry, another question? Yeah. Um, it, it's uh, it, number 36, the advice from Queensland Lexus to Council that it's cost you. It strikes me that the scale would be significantly greater there. So I, I just wonder how safe it is to extrapolate from there to the, the Dunedin situation that would be 
talking at Troll. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, I guess my only comment on that would be if, if we if we do progress down this path, we would need to give that much more careful consideration for the Dunedin example. That that is just um, really just relaying what has been provided to me by a, a um, staff member over at Queenstown Lakes. Um, certainly, except there is a, a difference in scales, um, but I, I guess it's just there as an example. Yeah, rather than rather than a assumption that the same could apply in Dunedin. Well, Councillor Pete. Yeah. Richard, um, it, as we all know, that there have been two summer camping seasons um, where, uh, during which this trial has been conducted. At Macandrew Bay, uh, that's, that's generated most complaints. Uh, can, you, can you tell us just the difference between the two seasons? Because uh, there's been changes made for the second season in terms of signage, in terms of uh, security patrols. Uh, yeah, uh, I can give you an I obviously wasn't yeah, here for the general, first season, but in, in general, general I can. Yeah. Uh, the, there have been a similar, similar issues, particularly with the volume of campers um, at those sites. I think one thing that has changed is uh, the messaging to the community at McAndrew Bay has been consistent around the end of the trial being um, the end of April this year, and that, that council would be reviewing that as required by the policy. So that has resulted in, I, I think, um, some of those complaints um, not coming through to council because they, they were aware that a review was, was on the table. But I, th I don't think there's been a significant change in the numbers of campers still using McAndrew Bay. Right. And, sorry, just one more. Um, yeah. Same page, point four, four point five. At the bottom there, there's a reference to a final a report coming from DOC uh, yes. about a possible DOC-style campsite. And is there any indication yet when that might come, just get in light of the fact that there's only a few months really between the yeah. time uh, we consider this, look at it, possibly look at a bylaw, and, and when the next season starts? Yeah, there is. Um, we've, we've received a draft report now um, that DOC are reviewing along with, with council staff. Um, I can't give any more information. I haven't had a, a detailed look through it yet. Um, we're obviously aware the time frames are, are pretty tight. Um, and we need to work with DOC um, through that report and then um, a decision on whether or not they feel it is, it is a suitable project for them on one of their sites. Thank you. Mm. Just, just on that, <coughs> in that same paragraph, the last bit of paragraph 40, there's a bit of DOC speak over the page. Yep. Can you just tell me what it means? The last bit that says, a key objective of the department Grow the community connection to locally important sites that affect the greatest number of people, in this case urban, through partnerships. I don't know what language that is, so I'm just wondering if you yeah. can help me. So that, that is, you're right, it is from, from DOC. So they, in order, in order for them to get this through, it needs to, um, it needs to be a direct link to, to their key objectives, and, and that is one of them. So that they do feel that um, our contact at DOC here um, are are comfortable that, that this would be a project that would have a high oh, priority. When we have the opportunity, I will be able to ask DOC staff what that means. Yep. Um, no further questions. Councillor Hawkins, you were wanting to move the recommendation. I take it you're Excuse referring me. to 41A. Oh, Councillor Wiley, I'm sorry, you're on my list. Thank you, one of my favourite topics. This for a question, that is. It is, yes. Um, Richard, you know, I appreciate what you and your staff have done over the summer. Um, we've been on regular dialogue. <coughs> to get speedy replies that you have has been brilliant and to see that you've been on top of the issue. Um, how are you working with the other councils around the country, um, for example, Coromandel and Marlborough? Uh, I haven't had any contact with them directly. Uh, the only, um, I've reviewed all their, their bylaws um, and any information that's come out of particularly teams who have obviously been subject to a, a High Court review of their bylaw. I haven't had any direct conversations with Marlborough or uh, teams. Um, obviously, there must be other councils going through similar issues as we are. You know, obviously Queenstown, Queenstown Lakes, but in the North Island as well. Were you in talking to any of those others? No. no. Um, one of the parts that I found very interesting in reading this and looking at what we've been through is on page 4.36 was the definition of self-contained. Um, I think that to me was one of the key highlights in looking through when we look at the vehicles. So, is that going to be a key step because self so in the sense of the um, process? Uh, well, the definition of self-contained is, is 
really in, in, in the majority of bottles and also now is a set by the New Zealand standards um, and, and that is the only consistent definition. So they, they have a suite of standards that, that is that a vehicle needs to meet in order to receive that self-contained sticker that um, is, is um, and that, that is that is what is applied in, in, in almost all instances in bylaws and for consistency and clarity for me that is that would be the appropriate step. Having the three okay. days self-contained. Sorry? Having the three days self-contained ability. Uh, yes, that's that's part of that New Zealand standard, yes. Okay. So can I just ask about that before you go on? So what about the other sticker that, that refers to the self-containment that's contained in the portable plastic potty that's in the back of the van, rather than a fully yeah, so self-contained that, that, that wouldn't apply and that would be up um, in any future policy or bylaw to ensure we're very clear. We would have the full ability to preclude that. That's right, correct. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do we have any numbers coming through yet on how the growth of um, Camper van market is growing from New Zealand tourism companies? No, we, we haven't as yet. Okay. Um, do you think that will, will there be a possibility of getting that before, as we go through to June 8th? Yes. But obviously that's kind of, the market's only dramatically increased over the last few years. Yeah, I, th I think we would be able to get our hands on that information. Okay, involvement with the Motor Caravan Association, what are we looking there? Uh, at this stage, none obviously pending a, a decision from, from Council today. Um, if, if there is to be um, a review as recommended, then they would be a stakeholder we would have significant conversations with given their interest in, in this topic. Do they have any developments on, uh, in, any areas in development at the moment or looking at new areas to set up? Uh, in terms of camps in Dunedin? Yeah. Not that I'm aware of, just, just the one that they've got existing. Um, involvement with campground owners? Uh, again, at this stage not, um, but certainly a, a key stakeholder for us to engage with if, if we do undertake a review. Okay. Um, we're looking at um, Dr James Henry's report on 4.44. Um, I was really interested to see that the um, how the visitor spend was going and, and what the campers were doing. Um, when you, we see this, do we? What were the keys that you got out of it that were important to the city? Uh, well, I guess the probably important thing is that this report's an enterprise land report based on Dr. Harvey's. Um, he undertook the survey and provided the data to um, Sophie, and, and she has undertaken to, to pull it together. Um, I, I haven't done too much analysis of the spend itself. I was more interested in the in the communications and how campers were finding out about the rules and in terms of what communication we'll need for the future. So that's probably a question we need to direct back to Enterprise. Mm. Okay, I was just really conscious that the top five attractions were all free attractions mm. in the graph, and they weren't actually spending ones. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Hawkins. You were happy to move. Yeah, I'm going to move. That's the recommendation on 4 1. Yep. The preferred option. Seconded, Councillor Noon. Further discussion? Councillor Peak. Oh, I, I just certainly like to endorse so what Councillor Wiley said about, about the effort of the staff to uh, conduct a trial in a meaningful way and, and, and try to contain some of the complaints that have, um, have uh, uh, emanated from uh, McAndrew Bay in particular. Um, it, it, it seems to me that, that we are looking at something actually for the end, the official end of the trial on 30 April, so we're trying to expedite some some action that, that uh, will tidy up, fix the shortcomings in a, in a, in a, a bylaw review and, uh, and a policy around that, and, um, and, and just tidy things up for next year because I think um, the, the people of McAndrew Bay, whether they uh, are opposed or, or, or actually not too worried about um, camping need to be reassured on this question. It has been dividing the, that uh, community for now a couple of years uh, and I, I think we all want to see some sort of resolution that, we'll, that we can live with because everybody wants to see tourists on, on the Targa Peninsula and it is certainly one of the great places to visit uh, if you're interested in wildlife and scenery, coastal scenery. Um, so thanks, thanks for your work on that and uh, I look forward to some you know, to buy more and other changes that will, will make this possible and make our, make our peninsula a welcoming place. Thank you, Councillor Noon.
Thanks, Mr Chairman. Uh, look, once again, I welcome the report and welcome the step towards reviewing the bylaw. Just a couple of comments about Warrington. Um, it didn't feature us uh, for the security patrols. Just a bit of, bit of local knowledge. Uh, the feedback, uh, generally speaking, has been positive. Um, however, I did receive a letter from a resident who indicated some summer nights there were between 20 and 45 vehicles on the domain. Um, historically, there's always been freedom camping occurring on that, on that site as long as I can remember. But um, the point is, at times, there were really just too many vehicles um, uh, to, there, there wasn't adequate infrastructure to cope with the number, simple as that. But generally speaking, quite positive out there. And I'd have to acknowledge a number of locals who took it upon themselves to provide um, a bit of advice about whether, you know, where the rubber should go or what they should and shouldn't do on the, on the domain. So uh, that was nice to have that partnership working away, even though it wasn't an official partnership. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. I, I just um, wanted to almost follow, uh, follow on well from Councillor Noon to say that while there have been concerns in certain areas, I have to say that there is a large part of Dunedin where freedom camping has worked very, very well. Um, and that I am amazed the number of people I see camper vanning and tenting as well, which isn't covered off in this um, bylaw at all. Well, in fact, I think we precluded it. Um, and um, on our road in Sato 87, right up towards Hyde and beyond. And it's done really, really well and in a really caring and, um, manner. So I, d I hope we're not throwing out the, the baby with the bathwater really on this one. And um, uh, but just because of what's happening in one particular area. And I think what we have to do is make it very clear that there is free, freedom camping is um, a great thing for Dunedin. It's a great city to come with freedom camp, and that includes tenting. And I hope we can cover that one off because I'm again amazed by the number of cyclists with tents mm. on State Highway 87. It's nothing I would ever do, but some do do it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm sure it's actually a problem of solving itself mm. now that the German tourist, tourist, young tourists have discovered they can get free camper vans at Christchurch anyway. Oh. You haven't read the news? No, not today. I'll explain later. Um, Councillor Hawkins, oh, Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. I think this was a you know, great <coughs> report. We're moving in the right direction. The key thing is we've got to be seen to be open for tourism and continue to promote tourism. You know, unfortunately, there's a few that really stuff it up for the rest. And I think, you know, as we move forward on this, I think we really will have a, a holistic or a great overview of freedom camping in the city that's going to benefit all parts of the community, but also really looking after the residents as well. And I think that's the important part. And I think and freedom camping is growing and it's going to continue to grow. We have to embrace it, but we need to embrace it so it's benefit for the visitors and for the residents. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins, your right of reply. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I just want to endorse your appraisal of Mr Saunders' uh, handling of, of the situation of baptism of fire in this organisation, um, dealing with, uh, uh, with community concerns that have bordered on the hostile, uh, quite frankly, and so uh, thank you for being such a model public servant, Mr Saunders, and dealing with them. Um, I'm pleased to hear from, pleased to get acknowledgement from Councillor Pete that this is um, a divisive issue. It's all too often presented to us as a unified concern of the Peninsula community and um, I for one have fielded um, feedback from locals of McAndrew Bay who have been embarrassed at uh, how their community has treated our visitors and particularly who their uh, community leaders have handled that situation. Um, by, and, and I am concerned a little bit by uh, the economic development focus of this report. I think the environmental impacts and the impact on our parks and reserves are uh, as important, if not more so, but I have uh, faith in um, the, the draft to come to us subsequently that, that, that will canvas uh, all of those. Um, so just, I guess, finally, by, I mean, by supporting this recommendation, we're setting in motion a process uh, where we can uh, collectively, as a community, come up with a more um, constructive response to the uh, well, constructive solutions, because um, these problems aren't going to go away anytime soon as much as we may wish them to. Um, so just an appeal, I guess, uh, for, uh, for everybody involved to uh, take a step back, hopefully, over the next few months and uh, engage with us uh, on this process. Thank you. Uh, I'll put it those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against no. That's agreed unanimously. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Mr. Silverman. That takes us to...
the final agenda item. Item 5, Ms. McGill and others. Yes, through the chair. Um, I just wanted to say that due to the high level of community interest in regards to the dog control bylaw, we do consider it um, requires further further consultation in some specific areas. Uh, those are outlined in our report, and there will be some other areas that we will be considering as well. For example, the permit of two or more dogs, um, looking at exercise parks, working dog definition, some of the other areas we'd like to look at. And we'd also think that we need to currently look at the prohibited areas and the um, non-prohibited areas, well, permitted areas, should I say. We need to look at them very carefully because this is 10 years old and there will be things that have changed over that time. Um, and so I think if by doing that we will hopefully have some idea of the opinion of the community and their feedback to develop a draft bylaw that will reflect that. Thank you. Can I kick off the questions then? Just a question about... Um, the figures that you provided on 5.2, while I've, I've got no issue with further consultation issues like this, whether that will um, help us or not remains to be seen, but um, I'm, I'm concerned at the presentation of the figures given the fact that they represent um, small cohorts, and what I mean is that my understanding is they're the percentages of the people who self-identified um, in the pop-up survey either dog owners or non-dog owners, but there are 126,000 people roughly living in the city and only 13,000 13, of those are dog owners. Um, there might be 16,000 dogs, but 13,000 dog owners. And so those figures on 5.2 aren't actually meaningful percentages, quite the opposite, because the dog owning cohort is 10% uh, roughly of the population of the city. That's, is that correct? That's the number that we have on our records at right. the moment. So I'm just wondering if in future when you present documents like this, rather you might, while it is quite accurate to talk about those percentages in reference to the survey, it would be really helpful to put out right at the start that the dog owning um, section of our city is 10% of the population because that is a slight effect on the weighting of the views of those two groups, the 90% um, of uh, non-dog owners, and I don't think that's reflected in the review. So if I could just make you appeal to do that. Other questions, please? There appear to be none. The recommendation is... Oh, there are some. Uh, Mr Cull. Uh, just note your recommendation that um, we, <coughs> we go back for further engagement, and I'm interested to know... You, you've got two options here, and I'm interested to know why you felt that you needed a better understanding of community opinion. So I guess I'm asking about your confidence in what you've already heard, that you feel you need to go for uh, another round, as it were, whereas um, your option two indicates that you could get similar information or s by another means, by short circuit, to get them going straight to a, a draft. So. I guess the answer to that is that we'd like to, um, we'd like, the council would, uh, is probably going to be in a better position if they can adopt a, a, a draft bylaw for formal consultation that is actually informed um, to the greatest extent possible as opposed to putting up a, a straw man um, bylaw for community feedback. And we think that further consultation will help um, inform that bylaw. Well, I guess what I'm asking is, because there's nothing wrong with with a straw man, if that's what you say it is, if you identify it. So I guess what I'm asking is you're not, on the consultation you've done so far, you're not confident that the straw man would be robust enough? Um, well, the information we've got so far is based on 800 people that, that chose to give their feedback. So we think yeah, it would be better to have another cut. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Of all of the further community engagement steps that you are proposing you take under option one, which of those would you not have undertaken as part of the formal consultation process for option two? And if we go with option one, will you then do all of those things twice, once before the draft policy and bylaw is put out for submission and then once afterwards as part of that consultative procedure? Uh, so the first round of um, community engagement was just the opt-in survey and uh, the people's panel survey, um, as well as some engagement with stakeholders. Now that that feedback has um, shown some areas where there could be differences in community opinion um, against the, the current policy and bylaw, we're wanting to target that consultation to those specific areas so we can understand the, those areas some more. Um, and I think that means that when we have when we go out for consultation on a Formal consultation on a on draft bylaw will be in a much better position to have, um, or we'll be at a better starting point for that formal consultation. That wasn't quite my question, sorry. I'll, sorry. I'll, I'll try again. Um, all of the things, I mean, just reading 17, for example, under option one, this reads like what we would go out and do when we were consulting on uh, a bylaw as part of the consultation process. So if you're proposing to do that before the formal process. I'm assuming that we will then turn around and do it again as part of the engagement around the formal consultation process. Uh, not necessarily. This this pre -engage, the second stage of pre-engagement that we're proposing would be more of an informal engagement as opposed to formal consultation where there's a, a draft bylaw um, and formal submissions and hearings. So there wouldn't be that at this stage. Um, and we wouldn't necessarily go um, to that level of engagement for the formal process if, if Council felt confident in, um, in their proposed bylaw. Um, Mr Chairman, I'm, I'm happy to move option two that we adopt what I'll come to you in a moment. Councillor Wilson. Uh, so I just, um, taking up the point that Councillor Hawkins made in the previous paper about the strategies that are affected, I'm intrigued that the integrated transport strategy isn't one that's ticked off here, considering that where we tend to try and have footpaths or cycleways and let people on there with dogs, often with leads, they are often seen as in conflict. And I see, and I'm slightly concerned what's going to happen at the St Leonard's Mire, and as that extends and it becomes more popular, whether dogs and leads are going to be an appropriate place to on on walking cycling routes. Um, so, so I'm just wondering, you, it, it isn't ticked as detracts or contributes, it, it's not applicable and, under your summary of considerations. Is there going to be, when, if you undertake a wider review, that sort of con, um, consideration? We've already got it presumably in the octagon, in that area. Yeah, but, um, this is the first round of using this report template, okay. so we are still learning ourselves yeah. uh, um, on, on um, particularly that strategic uh, framework fit section, um, but it's definitely something that we'll, we'll look into. Thank you. Councillor Calvin. I'm not sure quite whether this is the appropriate place, but it may be. Can we, if we're consulting with people, ask them also whether they think it's appropriate that the owners of poorly behaved dogs um, are funded at least partially by the owners of well-behaved dogs in a way we don't do with cars. You know, poorly behaved cars have their own costs and beside that we spread them across the whole community. For some reason we've targeted the owners of well-behaved dogs and charged them part of the cost of administering poorly behaved dogs. Is this something we can ask while we're consulting about a bylaw or is it not, is it not part of the bylaw what we our registration procedures. So those decisions wouldn't be part of a bylaw, but if we're doing some pre-engagement or community engagement in the area of, of dog or animal control, then that's definitely something that we can um, ask the community for feedback on. That, that apportionment of costs is part of the annual plan, is in terms of the public good component of those fees. Yes, but what I'm saying is there's three bits here. There's the public good, and there's the bad dog owner, and there's the good dog owner. and the good dog owner pays for the bad dog owner partially. And that's separate from whether the community 
Well, I think the point, for it. point is, Council, it's not part of the debate around the bylaw, it's part of a debate around the annual plan and, and the, the setting of that, that apportionment. No? Um, Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. What are, the trends of, what are the trends of dog ownership around the world? Like, one of the biggest ones I start seeing is dogs in the workplace. So, are we starting to see that happen in Dunedin? Sorry, could you clarify your question, please? Well, we're looking at whether we go to further engagement or whether we just adopt the draft policy. You know, and you talk about pop-up stands and face-to-face -face discussions. Are we talking to employers and people like that in regards to you know, whether the dogs in the workplace are something that are trends that are going to take in Dunedin? For example, PricewaterhouseCoopers did it last Friday. That's, that's a private matter, and if they wish to have dogs within the workplace, if I'm um, understanding your, your question correctly, it wouldn't be a um, matter for the bylaw to address. But getting to and from work, and for some of these businesses, obviously accessing some of the areas. If they're going directly to, from one place to another through the business area, that, that's permitted, if they have to access the workplace. Okay. All right. Um, Councillor Hawkins, now you want to move option two. Okay, you have done that. Is there a seconder, please? Seconded by the Mayor. So the effect of this would be to get on with it rather than get on with it later. Straw man or not. Do you want to speak to it now or just to write a reply? Further discussion? Then Mr Hawkins, you write a reply. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, my board attempts to reach a consensus around a contentious issue such as this one. Um, any draft policy or bylaw that we go out to the public with isn't going to please everyone, as any of my colleagues who have sat on the local alcohol policy process uh, can attest. Um, but that, that isn't an excuse in and of itself, I don't think, um, to put up something uh, for public discussion through that process. Um, it certainly doesn't warrant uh, two whole rounds of uh, public engagement to come to that process. So. Um, Let's get on with it. Oh, well, I'm sure um, the staff will be happy at the reduced work involved in that. I'll put it. Those in favour, please. Oh, sorry, that was the right of reply. Those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against no. That is also agreed unanimously. Uh, are there any items that you wish to alert me that you wish to add to an agenda for the future, Councillor Wilson? Just taking on Councillor Vandervis's uh, comments and questions of Dr Griffin. I'm just wondering whether there should be a consideration for review of um, both subdivision bylaw um, or uh, code of subdivision and or any consent conditions that should be appropriate around a night sky. And I think that comes under your matters of interest. It will come in, the, in this committee most likely in terms yeah. of consent. So can we make a note of that? <coughs> Thank you. We'll get well, thanks. Thank you for that. Could, could, could we broaden it so slightly if the staff are going to be looking at consent conditions uh, with night sky in view in the future, could they also look at the possibility of addressing some retrospective issues? Uh, I know, for instance, there have been a lot of complaints from uh, regarding Port Otago light spill uh, down at Port Chalmers. Um, this must have a quite large effect uh, because some of those lights are completely un- uh, sh shut it at all. Well, so, I'll ask Mr. Yeah. Pickford to check on whatever complaint uh, about that issue and ask you if you've got any particular information to give that to Simon so he, that can be followed up. Just, Thank you. Just, just a word, word of caution on Councillor Vanderfuss's point about existing light spill. If they've been lawfully established, it's a different kettle of fish than creating a, uh, and reviewing a Let's have a look at it. Yeah, I'm just suggesting we look at two kettles of fish. Well, we agree to that. All right. In that case, I'll declare the meeting. Oh, Councillor Wilson. No, no, that's just Councillor that's Wilson is giving me a rude gesture, which means she wants five minutes before the meeting starts. We'll take a break for five. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for your cooperation. Uh,